Sounds good. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Illuminating Microsoft 365. Uh, my name is Richard Calderon. I'm a modern workplace strategist with the Pate Group, and uh, I'm going to be flying solo on this webinar today. Or normally, I would have my co-host uh, Joy Apple with me. She's actually in, I believe, sunny Branson, Missouri, the next couple of days at the North American Collaboration Summit. Um, so, nonetheless, uh, myself and Stacy on the line here decided that we wanted to go ahead and continue on pressing along with our illuminating Microsoft 365 webinar series nonetheless because we know how much uh, it's been really well received by most of you. So again, thanks for joining here today. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Richard Calderon. I have been uh, doing Microsoft consulting services for a number of years now at this point, and my role here at Pate is very much entirely focused on customer success. So wanting to really try to understand where your business is going and where some of the pain points are, what's sort of the next things on your list of things to do to help the business um, move forward. And then, of course, how can Microsoft technologies, in this case specifically around Microsoft 365, how can those be leveraged to be able to help you achieve those goals? Um, that's my role. And of course, you can also reach out uh, to me a number of different ways. Certainly follow me on Twitter if you'd like. I try my best to get out and tweet as much information as we possibly can to keep you guys informed on what's going on. So as always, I um, want to start off with just a brief little poll here just to get a sense of who's who's in the room. Um, if you'd like to respond to the poll, you can find a link to it in the Q&A window. And um, just a couple of different questions here just to kind of get a sense based on the topic for today. So we've got uh, responses coming in here already. Thanks very much. Certainly always interested to understand who's in the room here at this point. Um, but then also want to get some understanding generally about some uh, some of you, what you have currently in place around governance for Microsoft Teams. So it looks like uh, I've got at least one response so far at this point. Um, do you currently have a governance plan? Looks like not just yet, so we certainly need one. So great, so hopefully you'll get uh, some good information based out of our conversation here today. Do you allow business users to create their own teams? And yes, you do, and that's completely fine to do that. Um, that's certainly Microsoft's preferred method, if you will, for allowing teams to just be created um, on their own. Got some more folks chiming in here, so thank you. And then how do you manage the team's creation process? Looks like that, um, again, from the current respondents, respondents don't yet currently have a way or an approach for that. Um, and then for uh, the one person who says, no, no, we're certainly restricting the way that uh, users can create teams. Looks like you've done that through creating your own teams uh, request process, which is great. So again, there's a number of different ways that that can be done. But if you'd like to continue to respond to the poll, please just feel free to do that anywhere along the way um, throughout the webinar. OK, so kind of laying the foundation here a little bit for the conversation. So Teams governance, really, the way that we tend to look at it is there's at least three major aspects around governance planning in terms of the overall approach that you need to be thinking about in different degrees. Um, there's certainly the overall lifecycle management of teams themselves. That is, you know, how are teams created throughout the entire use of teams? There's going to be management around what can be done and what you do with the content and so forth. But then at the tail end of the life cycle, when a team is not necessarily useful anymore, uh, or maybe for any number of reasons, you need to ensure that that data has been either set aside for archive or absolutely needs to be deleted so that you're minimizing risk of exposure of that information. Uh, Lifecycle management is one key aspect for approach and planning for governance. What types of features you're also making available to your users, how you're managing that, um, how that applies to your business based on whether you are highly regulated or you know what your industry is, et cetera. But coming up with that matrix of what features of teams are you going to enable, disable? Um, are you going to allow certain features for users internally versus external users? Are you even going to allow external users? All of those capabilities to fall into that range around feature management for uh, your governance approach. 
And then clearly when it comes to the content itself, what kind of information are we placing into Teams? Again, from those of you that have been in any of our previous Teams webinars um, and have heard us say many times that Microsoft Teams at the very least is a way to be able to allow your teams of people to be able to manage conversations and content. So what kind of content, file-based content, other types of data, how do you prevent that information from being shared uh, intentionally if it's considered sensitive information, et cetera. So lifecycle feature and content management are the uh, primary pillars for planning in governance approach. So only showing you this slide just to kind of, you know, sort of peel back the layers a little bit from a logical architecture perspective to say that there's a lot of moving parts in teams. Again, most of you all who've been in doing this team stuff for a while know that um, teams is what Microsoft refers to as the hub for teamwork. So it does a whole lot of things. It is the successor for Skype for business. So you can use it for chat and presence indication as well as online meetings, et cetera, et cetera. You certainly can use it for um, meetings like we're having now, which is a live meeting, but you can do it as well for meetings inside your organization as well. Um, and then those Teams workspaces, those online workspaces that allow you again to be able to organize content, conversations, files that are stored in SharePoint, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different moving parts in here. So there's lots of things to consider about when you're really thinking about your overall governance plan. So ultimately you have to make some decisions somewhere along the way and you have to agree on what those decisions are and then ideally be able to put those decisions into practice. Um, and then again, we're going to talk more about how do you communicate those decisions and some what we consider to be best practices about communicating those, but things like, you know, who can create teams and do you have naming standards or not? One of the biggest ones that's always top of mind for most people is do you or do you not allow guest access? Um, which apps are allowed and et cetera, et cetera. Lots and lots of decisions. And then how do you go about managing those governance policies and, and settings that you've provided in the Microsoft 365 service in and of itself? Um, what Microsoft provides, two primary ways of being able to do that. There's certainly the user interface, which is from both the Microsoft 365 admin center as well as from Azure Active Directory Administration Center, depending on what it is that you're trying to govern in this case. And then within the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, a number of those different other admin, specific admin centers such as Teams or even security compliance. There can be a number of different places from the UI that you can go in and provide the governance policies and settings. And then there are also some that you have to specifically either do through command line um, or you can just simply choose to set them via command line automation if that's something that you choose to do so. And again, these are the management tools that are built in to Microsoft 365. This is not inclusive of if you're considering or have looked at some third party vendors um, who also provide Microsoft 365 and Teams governance solutions. Um, those go outside above and beyond even just these management tools themselves. So in thinking about this particular webinar you know again there's there's a lot of different factors involved a lot of different things but again based on our experience where the rubber meets the road when you're really trying to get down to deciding okay what do we need to put in place and what do we need to be thinking about to try to drive a real successful plan for governance of microsoft teams um, i thought that it broke down really into these four primary pillars here really needing to ensure that you find that right balance that works for your organization, because really no organization's governance plans or policies are going to be exactly the same. Um, but you know, obviously, how do you create the teams? Who could create them and for what purpose? Which apps and features are gonna be available? Things like that. So finding the right balance between um, being kind of a free for all wild, wild west where just everybody can do what they want versus being overly controlled which then just sort of frustrates everybody in the use of Microsoft Teams and they end up kind of going around you anyway. You wanna certainly try to avoid that. You also definitely wanna have a fair, uh, solid plan, if you will, or understanding of what that process would look like in terms of not only who should create the teams, but how are they being created? Again, other considerations such as whether you're going to have naming conventions and are you gonna enforce them and how, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's a second 
success factor that we considered here. And then the content lifecycle in terms of what happens to information, conversations, files, data, again, that's all part of that overarching content management factor that we talked about earlier. And then something that oftentimes really just is an afterthought when it comes to any of these types of governance implementations is that overall communication as well as the training, how you're going to help provide that information to your users so that everyone at the very least is clear on what's available to me, what's not available to me, and why is it not available to me, and what are the expectations that you have of me as a user in actually affecting the governance plan themselves. Um, so how will you communicate those to your users? And of course, how will you train them? Ideally also that it's evolving over time so that you can gain feedback from your users if there's something about your governance plan that maybe is just simply unclear or maybe it's too restrictive again or uh, you know it's creating challenges for your users you want the ability to be able to get feedback from them so you can evolve it over time so as i mentioned one of those first key considerations is certainly around finding balance again you can look at this as a spectrum between having on the far right hand side of the screen just sort of turning on teams and letting everybody go no controls or limits and that can cause problems fairly quickly in many organizations we've seen that and have had to try to come in after the fact and help affect some sort of a governance plan that sort of reigns in a little bit of that craziness where there's no control versus on the other side of the spectrum on the left hand side of the screen if it's completely restrictive and overly controlled, again, your users are just going to find ways to work around you, um, especially because so much of this information is made available today out on the Internet. Uh, those of you that know that last week was Microsoft's Ignite conference where they talk about all the great new things that are coming to the Microsoft cloud services. You know, when your end users get wind of some of these capabilities and then they look for that in the tools, but you've locked it all down, uh, that can be extremely frustrating and or disappointing for them. So the idea is to find that balanced governance in between. Again, whatever makes sense for your organization, there is no necessarily right or wrong, but we find that it tends to be a combination of both policies that you set at the system level. So again, as an administrator, you have the ability to control a number of different capabilities and so forth that are and aren't available to your users. So you can set those at the system level via policy. And then there are guidelines. There are areas where you really just want to say, look, we're not going to manage this for you, but we are going to make some recommendations. We are going to tell you per our company policy or company guidelines rather, this is how we expect for you to do these things. And maybe that's gonna be something that is gonna start off with some guidelines and again, the training and the communication. And then eventually over time, you might flow those back into the system level so that they're being managed actually via policy or vice versa. It might be something that you start off with as a policy, but then you open that up over time to become more of a guideline and less restrictive because again, as your users get more um, mature with their use of Microsoft Teams, then you might give them more ability to manage that on their own. So when you think about who can create Teams, uh, again, by default, actually just to point out here, by default, anybody who has Exchange Online, a mailbox in Exchange Online, by default has the permission to create Teams because they have the permission to create Microsoft 365 groups. So again, in some of our previous webinars, we've talked a little bit about the fact that Microsoft 365 Groups, formerly Office 365 Groups, is kind of that underlying membership foundation on which Microsoft Teams really sits. So whenever a Microsoft team is created, it's actually creating a Microsoft 365 Group behind the scenes, which is a membership object in Active Directory. It contains a set of members, and then it also provisions an exchange mailbox that's shared by that set of members, a SharePoint site that is used for, at the very least, for storing files and it's connected to Teams, and a number of other things, um, a planner board, a OneNote notebook, all these things get created automatically when a Microsoft team gets created. So again, because if a user has a mailbox in Exchange, they automatically have the permission to create Microsoft Teams. One of those first factors is you need to decide 
who should be able to do that? Again, do you want to let anyone in the org, which is fairly open? Again, that's the that's the default in doing that. Do you want it to be only admin? So you want to lock that down to where only administrators can and your users would have to submit a request of some sorts for teams to be created. There also is an in the middle here in this case. You can, and we have had work with a number of organizations where you can delegate to specific people and um, that could be other IT people in the organization. If maybe you've got a distributed IT organization and you've got people that sit at a local sort of a site level IT, you could delegate to them or you could also delegate to business users. It really can be anyone in the organization that you want to delegate the creation of teams to. However, it does require, there is a licensing consideration in that. It does require Azure Active Directory Premium Plan 1 at the very least um, to be able to affect that policy to say this group only has the ability to create Microsoft Teams. So just something to consider. Again, we found that to be very successful in a number of companies that we've worked with because it takes the the sole pressure of Teams creation off of primary IT um, and then allows it to get closer to the business so that maybe there is again a business owner either of a specific group or department or region even for that matter who is the primary contact for that set of users when they have a need for a new team they can simply request it from that particular user and again that would require that azure ad premium license for those people who are going to be doing the creation of teams so it doesn't mean that everybody needs it it just means the people that are going to be creating teams need to have that azure ad premium license so again talking about creation of teams you also have to be thinking about well, what features are going to be available guest access is always ones that pops up and again, there isn't a right or wrong for this. It just depends on what the business need is within your organization. If you have regulatory requirement restrictions for allowing guests and so forth, but just know that you have the ability to be able to turn this on. This is not on by default, by the way. This is turned off by default whenever Teams is uh, sort of first enabled or you first are setting up Teams for your organization. It is turned off by default. You do have to turn it on. But then once you've turned on the ability to have guests, which are again people from outside your org that can come in and participate inside of your teams with conversations and sharing files, uploading files, et cetera. Um, once you do that, you have a whole set of different options that you can change to determine what those guests can or can't do. And there really are two levels of that. One is at the overall uh, Microsoft 365 tenant level. And then there is at the team level where an owner can also go in and say, um, as long as those settings have been made available, then you can override those settings as well. OK, so guest access is certainly one of those primary features to think about. Just team settings in general, again, just kind of scratching the surface of what's available here for you all, but whether or not you're going to allow other file sharing options or other cloud file storage, uh, such as Dropbox or Box, et cetera, et cetera, you can do that, believe it or not. If your team organization is already invested in those solutions, you can enable the ability to integrate those in so that those can potentially still be utilized, um, but uh, surfaced through Microsoft Teams. And then again, a whole other set of other types of settings that you can choose from. Again, we're just scratching the surface of it, but these are some that apply at the team level here. Um, you can also apply a number of them per user by policy. Um, so it's a whole other set of options that you can configure. There's also app permissions that you want to consider as well too. So which types of apps do you want to allow for your users? You can either take some of these defaults, which is to just sort of allow them all, um, again, you have Microsoft apps, you have third party apps. Um, you can also have custom apps that you can deploy as well for your organization. Those are what they refer to as tenant apps in this case. So you can go in and tweak these and refine this so that you can choose which of these features you do or don't want to make available for your users. So kind of shifting into the, the next factor again. So we talked about one of those primary factors just simply being you know, striking that right balance, figuring out who can create and what features are on and off and so forth. But moving into that second area around. So once you've defined sort of what that process looks like, one of the primary things you should be considering again are do you want to in, uh, affect a naming policy of some sorts? Because for any of you who just sort of started off doing this, you probably have figured out the hard way pretty quickly 
that uh, people can just start choosing names of teams. And when they do that, it can get a little unwieldy fairly quickly. Because again, are you choosing um, keywords in your organization? Uh, is somebody choosing a name of a team that really uh, in your organization should belong to another team of some sorts? So coming up with a plan for whether or not you want to use naming policies early on is important. And again, you can do that either be via guidelines, which is that you're just going to tell people who can create groups, uh, this is what you should be naming your groups. You should either prefix them with this or suffix them with that, um, whatever it may be. You could do it via guidelines where you're trusting the users to take that responsibility, or you could certainly affect that via policy at the system level. And as I'm showing here on the screen, if you plan to do that, just know that again, that is another premium license for Azure Active Directory. You would need at the very least Azure AD Premium Plan 1. Um, what you're actually doing to affect a naming policy for Teams is creating a naming policy for Microsoft 365 Groups. So in Microsoft 365 Groups, policies are being set up for naming, then that also applies when teams are being created. And so again, you can set it up a number of different ways, but you can add prefixes, you can add suffixes, um, you can even block certain words again, as I mentioned, like keywords in your organization, maybe HR or CEO or something like that. Um, you can set those up as blocked words that cannot be used in the creation of teams. So again, if something to consider around naming policies, if you want to set it at a system level, it is something that you have to consider uh, a premium license for. Around the content itself, again, thinking about uh, what happens with that content over time. Do we just let people start to have conversations, upload files, which are really being stored in SharePoint that are connected to Teams, and then just let it go on forever and ever? Or do we have at least some kind of a thought process around a plan for setting expirations. So again, just know that you can you can set up uh, expiration policies essentially to help uh, limit what might be considered stale information in Teams over time. Yet again, just to point out, this is another one of those capabilities. If you want to set that up uh, at the system level, it does require Azure AD Premium Plan 1 for the team members that want to have that expiration policy essentially. Um, but it provides a number of benefits. It does allow for the owners of those teams to get notifications. You can set the expirations to be, you know, within 30 days, uh, send me a notification. Within 15 days, send me another notification. And then certainly the day before, um, let me know that it's going to expire so that they have the ability to renew the use of that team. Uh, if it's enabled by default, the expiration policy is 180 days. You can change that though. You can set that to be 365 days, or if you needed it to be a shorter time for it, you could set it to be 90 days, et cetera. Um, and then also know that once a team has expired, you can set that, or it by default has the ability to be recovered for up to 30 days. So if for some reason you've set that expiration policy and one of the team owners has not taken action to uh, renew that team, then you do have the ability, they have the ability to go in and recover that team again up to 30 days again after it's been expired. So nothing happens, the data doesn't get deleted, um, anything like that, it just sets it in a expired state for those 30 days so that it can be recovered in that way, okay? Another factor again, just now that a team is either expired or it has reached the end of its useful life, uh, you do have the ability to be able to archive teams that is something that is possible to do in Microsoft Teams. Again, that is all tied to Microsoft 365 groups, but uh, just know that the good news is that the service handles all of that for you on your behalf. So you don't have to worry about what about the SharePoint files and then what about my conversations and everything surrounded, everything sort of tied together in the unit of a Microsoft team can be archived together. Team owners can do that um, if they need to just simply archive that team for the purpose of being able to uh, have that information be referenceable for future use. Um, or in some cases, you know, you are going to archive that team and maybe you need to reactivate it again at some point in the future. You can also do that. You can set a team to be archived for that purpose as well. Just know that when you are archiving teams, um, the conversations themselves and the files become read only once they're archived. 
they're still searchable and so forth for users, but they do get set to read only. As a matter of fact, I believe there is a switch that you can choose on the files specifically to say whether or not you want those files to be read only or editable even for that matter after it's been archived. Um, but just generally speaking, I think it does make sense to set both the conversation and the files to become read only when they're archived. Um, so then any activity in that team is certainly frozen at that point in time. You can still add team members and team members can kind of come and go as needed. Uh, but again, everything in terms of conversations and posts and so on and so forth, those are all going to be frozen. So would certainly say that if you hadn't thought about that in terms of your governance plan, um, think about when and why you might consider archiving teams before deleting them. You certainly can delete teams, obviously, if you're at a point where you have no further use for that team. And in some cases, it maybe is the right decision to delete a team. But there really is no harm, I guess, if you will, in considering archiving a team for some length of time until at which point then you're absolutely certain that you really have no longer a need for it. And then you could just simply delete it from there. OK, kind of rounding this out here at this point now, just talking about again some of those factors we talked about, trying to find the right balance for your organization, trying to ensure that you have uh, you know, a plan for how teams are going to be created and are you going to have naming policies, et cetera. And then again, talking about content lifecycle governance. What are we doing with our sites and do we or do we not archive them, et cetera. But then that last one that again, that I feel like tends to be often overlooked really is this notion about communicating the governance policies and the guidelines to your users. Um, so I've got a few do's and don'ts here on the screen. I would say, you know, the few don'ts that I've got here are absolutely ones, real life examples from customers uh, who have felt like, OK, we've come up with our governance approach and at the very least, what we're going to do is we're going to send everybody an email. It's going to have kind of a basic info on what that governance plan or what the policies are. And maybe it's going to have some links to some training resources. It points to some links online and then you sort of feel like you're done. So please don't don't do that. That is going to be insufficient, I would say, at the very least, around a successful governance uh, approach in this case. And then secondarily, this is another one that really is kind of uh, near and dear to my heart here is please, please don't uh, create lengthy documents that you consider to be your governance plans and policies and then go store them somewhere in SharePoint and expect that everyone's going to read those because they simply won't. When content is buried like that, that far down deep into documents for that matter, uh, it just becomes stale information for the most part as soon as you've done that, really. It doesn't mean that you can't start off with you and the people that you've defined as your kind of your governance committee, if you will. It doesn't mean that you can't start off by drafting documents, obviously, and sharing those documents with each other so that you can get buy in and get clarity on what the decisions are. But once you're at the point of trying to communicate that with your users, please, please extract that out of those those documents and put them into web page format. There's a number of advantages of doing that really. So a couple of the do's that we have felt have been really useful for companies we work with is the creation of a, you can call it a Microsoft 365 adoption center for that matter, and create that as a SharePoint communication site. So again, for those of you that have followed along some of our other webinars know that when it comes to modern SharePoint, uh, you know, again, it's not your grandfather's SharePoint anymore. There's lots of great things you can do with modern SharePoint, one of which is the creation of these communication sites, which are these beautiful sites that allow you to be able to communicate broadly across your organization. Use that to create a adoption center, which would be inclusive of the information that you would create in this governance plan. Um, you could also adapt existing solutions such as the Microsoft 365 Learning Pathways site. If you haven't seen that, I would certainly encourage you to go to um, lookbook.microsoft.com and check out a number of the different templates there that Microsoft makes available. Uh, really, they're examples, but you could use them to actually go forth and create communication sites of this type and one of those examples there is the Microsoft 365 Learning Pathways, which is a fully content curated training portal that Microsoft makes available for you with a ton of guidance and information around how to use the Microsoft 365 applications and tools, including Microsoft Teams. Um, but when you do that, 
my recommendation would be don't just turn on Microsoft 365 Learning Pathways as is and then just send everybody the links to it. Use that as an opportunity to be able to weave in your governance policies and guidelines in line with that information so that you can, as the point I'm making here at the bottom of the screen, is help your users understand not just the how to do things, but also the how should I do those things as well. So again, those are all part of your governance policies and guidelines. You can incorporate those into something like a Microsoft 365 Adoption Center which you could use the learning pathway site for as a basis. OK, well, I mean, that's primarily information I wanted to cover here today, so I'm going to flip back over and see any questions or anything that's come in, Stacy, at this point. No, it's been pretty helpful. OK, all right. Well, if you did have any other questions at the moment, feel free to either weigh in on the Q&A. Happy to answer those as we go. And then if you don't get them in the Q&A, I will at least uh, show you the last screen here, which is um, contact information both for me and for Joy Apple as well too. Uh, you can certainly reach out to us here via email. You can always uh, tweet at us. Those are our Twitter handles there. And then if you happen to have your phone, Handy, you can also scan these QR codes here, which will take you directly to our LinkedIn profiles. And um, please, please connect with us on LinkedIn as well, too. We'd be happy to be able to interact with you all there as well. Um, so if you've got any additional questions, feel free to just reach out to us in a number of different ways. And then I know that we've got uh, on the plan to have, I think, a webinar next Tuesday as well, too. We don't have the information on all that squared away just yet but we will get that out to you as soon as we have that available as well. And um, if there was anything else, Stacey, anything else at this point before I'm missing? No, that's it, covered everything. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, short and sweet again on a Tuesday. Uh, for everybody that's joining, I really sincerely appreciate you taking your time out of your day and hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks.